Ladies and gentlemen, I am standing here with an icon, a legend in the comic book industry, Mr. Chris Claremont. Chris, how are you? Okay. Just okay? Well, when you're an icon and a legend, I don't know what, what, what the parameters are. That's a good answer. That's a very good answer because I didn't think about that. <laughs> so my first question you hear, you're greatly considered one of the pioneers of how comic stories are told nowadays. Your work reads like a Beatles Greatest Hits album. At least to me it does. While you worked on many characters, you're mostly, mostly mentioned with the phrase greatest X-Men stories. When you started working on the X-Men, did you expect it to be as hot as it was going to be? Well, when I started working on the X-Men, we thought the industry would be out of business in two years. You know, so none of us really had any expectations. It was just, we, let's have some fun. It was a bi-monthly title. It was in the lower half of the, the uh, sales or the publishing chart. Um, Dave and I just... Played it by the, flew by the seat of our pants and figured if, if we had fun, if we told good stories, that would be cool. It would either sell or it wouldn't, but whatever happened, we'd have good stories. Very excellent. The entire Phoenix Saga is arguably one of the greatest X-Men stories ever. How did you pitch the death of Jean Grey to the higher-ups? We didn't. She wasn't original... Our original hypothesis was she wasn't going to die. She would get off on a technicality. Jim felt what happened was that John, well, in 170, no, what, what am I doing, 174, 137, 36. The one previous no, the, the first... The first Phoenix episode, she goes and eats a planet. John, when it was printed, it was a, it turned out to be an, an inhabited planet, which we cleared with the editor-in-chief. We thought it was cool. We did it. Uh, we thought we had run all of the points of, the major points of the story arc through the editorial structure, and then we had a green light. Turns out, we were misinformed. And Jim, as editor-in-chief, felt it was inappropriate, to put it tactfully, to have a lead character commit planetary genocide, kill six and a half billion people, and get off on a technicality. So his, at this point, the issue was ready to go to the printer. We sat down, we had a, a day to figure out what to do, a weekend really. And the choice was either she goes to jail for forever or she dies. And I thought about it over the weekend and I came to the conclusion that Screw it, she dies. Because that'll be a much more dramatic ending to the story than, than just the long, laborious evolution of she's in jail, the X-Men rescue her from jail, the, the She-Ark recapture her and throw her back into jail, the X-Men rescue her from jail, etc., etc., etc. And this is one of those rare painfully wonderful moments of editorial creative synergy where we all ended up stumbling over what turned out to be the exact right ending of the story, which is Jean makes a moral choice. I have committed an unforgivable act. Even if I get pardoned, I have I cannot atone for what I have done, except with my death. Because no matter what happens, the possibility will always exist that it could happen again. Because Jean knew what we all knew, which was it's only a matter of time if she were still alive until we resurrected everything and 
set us on the, the path to this conclusion. So, she died. All right. <laughs> and as we all saw five, three years later, came back. Now, was it always planned for her to appear in Avengers? Or I should ask, why was it that they, the Avengers found her no, cocoon? she was dead. Right, but remember no, how they... No, the whole point was she was dead. Okay. Given everything we had gone through, and especially given the intensity of reader reaction, there was no get-out-of-jail card on this. The whole point was to establish once and for all you know, on a primal level, that death was a part of the X-Men's universe, that they were all at risk. If we could kill the, the distaff side of the second oldest romantic relationship in the Marvel Comics pantheon, anybody was vulnerable. And that made, for me as a writer and for, I think we felt Marvel as a company to have what by that time was a major growing title, have that level of uncertainty and hopefully dramatic tension to it is an incalculable asset. So the structure of the book was she's dead, she's not coming back, we move on with our lives. Scott met someone else, he fell in love with Madeline he got married, he had a baby, they had a baby, and the whole point was he would live, he and Madeline would live happily ever after, outside of the team. The team would grow up and move on. That's why we created Rachel, because we needed a representative of the Phoenix in the book, because the name and the, the character were too valuable to lose, but we wanted it to be different from what had been before. And that's why when John and Roger and the guy, you know, the guys on X Factor came up with the resurrection of Gene as the, the, the starting point for their series, my response was, if we do that, we're telling all the readers who embraced the death, fuck you. We just gotcha. And we can never do it again with anybody because we'll have lost that essential bit of credibility that a, that a publishing house establishes with their readers. Why should they trust us if we've, we lied to them once? And as an alternative, what I proposed was Scott's, let Scott live happily ever after. Gene has a sister. Worked for Darth Vader, can work for us. Luke, you have a sister. Well, Gene has a sister. Her, old, his, her older sister, who has superpowers. And what does that do? That brings another Grey into the Pantheon. Scott comes back with Madeline. He's the leader of the team, but he's married. He's off the board. But you have Sarah Grey, who's single. Yeah, she has a couple of kids because she's older, but she's single, she's available, and you have s suddenly Scott and Bobby and Warren in play as, a, as romantic po partner, potential romantic partners. It may work, it may not work, but you could string that out for two or three or four or five or ten or twenty years and have a really good time with it. And even if they just become great friends, you've got tension. We bring back Gene and just re reboot the Scott Gene relationship, there is no tension. It's just boring. And unfortunately, I was overruled. So that's all interesting because I, I never knew any of that. That's really good. And I grew up on this stuff. Go figure. All right. When Fox decided to do Days of Future Past, how involved were you with it besides Cameo? I wasn't involved at all. Really? Well, why would I be? I think they would come to the guy who helped create the storyline. I wrote the source material. How involved is the writer of the source material ever with the production of a film? Unless, of course, you're J.K. Rowling. Yeah, well, it's Fox, so, I mean, that says a lot. It doesn't matter who it is. It's like Brian 
Lauren Schuler Donner, Brian Singer, their whole production staff have been playing in the X-Men sandbox for over a decade and a half. Everybody knows what they want and what, they, what they're doing. I was there as an actor. Um, not, I'm not, you know, my, my contribution to the film other than as an actor, is that John and I created the source material. That's it. How did it feel, how does it feel to know that your source material is out there now and a bigger scale as opposed to just a book? Be nice if there was a credit. You didn't even get a credit? Nope. Fox has never given a credit to any of the X films. Uh, you've done charity work over the years as well with Life Beat and, uh, and in 2011 signing a deed to the gift Columbia University's rare book and manuscript library, donating all of your archives for all of your major writing projects to its graphic novel section. Can you tell us a little about that? They were interested. My wife wanted to get all the crap out of the house. We cut a deal. Simple as that. Well, I mean... We want to put all your stuff in the same section of the library as the Gutenberg Bible. Okay. I was, you know, I had the good fortune, the inestimable, inestimable good fortune to be the first comic book creator they approached. And Columbia is not a small minor league institution. I was both flattered and proud and it's nice to know that a this, the material is safe and as it turns out it's rather popular so my final question for you what are you working on now and what do you have planned next um try, trying to finish a novel and try to sell the novel and then get started on the next novel Really much done with the comics now? I am I am at Marvel's disposal. You know, it's their call. Whether I, if they if they want to use me, they know where I am. If they have other plans, that's their prerogative. Um, at the moment, I do what I do. And if it works, hoorah. If it doesn't work, do something else. I'm in the presence of greatness, people, so it, you, know, you got to expect it. So thank you again.